We are one week away from Easter week. And Easter week is the most important week in the Christian calendar. It is the week of Jesus' passion. Now, I know that when I say passion, many of you are thinking of desire or enthusiasm. But our word passion comes from the Latin passio, which means suffering. And why do I say it's the most important week in the Christian calendar? I mean, what about Christmas, right? I mean, doesn't the calendar begin in Advent? Ah, yes, that's true. But when you look at just the amount of content that our gospel writers include about the life of Jesus, there's not much written about his birth. But in fact, about that last week, that one week of Jesus's ministry, there's almost a third of the gospels written about Jesus. So even in the Gospel of Matthew, eight chapters out of 28, in Mark, six of 16, in Luke, six of 24, in John, 10 of 21 chapters. And during the week that leads up to Easter, usually I read through the accounts that are given by Mark and John, following along day by day. And on the Saturday before Palm Sunday, we find Jesus in Bethany as he's being anointed by Mary. On Palm Sunday, which we celebrate next Sunday, there's a triumphal entry, and then Jesus returns to Bethany that evening. On Monday, he comes back to Jerusalem and cleanses the temple of its, uh, ta of its um, uh, traitors and money changers. And then on Tuesday, he's in the temple area again, debating with the religious leaders. And then on Wednesday, the gospel writers are in fact silent. All we know is that Jesus and his disciples remain in Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem, and Judas is spending the day arranging the betrayal. And then on Thursday, the Last Supper in the upper room before Jesus and his disciples go off to Gethsemane. And then in the wee hours of the morning of Friday, you see the betrayal, the arrest, the trials, and ultimately the crucifixion. And then on Saturday, once again, the gospel writers have nothing as Jesus is lying in the tomb until, of course, on Easter Sunday, which we're about to celebrate soon in a couple of weeks. But as I read each year through those passages, it seems like I'm walking with Jesus through the Passion Week. And if any of you would like to know what passages to read, then I have with me uh, a, a, a piece of paper that you can look at what passages to read as we approach next Saturday of walking with Jesus through the Passion Week. And I believe that revisiting the Passion Week each year helps us to appreciate even more the great suffering that Jesus endured on the cross, what we've just been singing about, what he endured for our salvation, especially when we get to the arrest part and his trials that endured throughout the night, and then the beatings from the Roman soldiers and the mocking from the crowd leading up to the pain that he had to endure while carrying his own cross through the streets of Jerusalem and ultimately being nailed to that cross through his hands and his feet. It helps me at least to still each year be in wonder and in awe of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I think we should never lose that wonder. And now is a good time to be revisiting that Passion Week. And today, as we celebrate what's called the Lord's Supper, it is, in fact, a celebration intended to remind you and me that Jesus gave his body. He gave his blood for my sins, for your sins. And it should remind us of all those things. That in fact, we've been studying in Romans. We're taking a break from Romans, but it should remind us of all those things like the fact that God's righteous decree for all those who practice those sins of ungodliness and unrighteousness listed in chapter one, we deserved to die. And while we were still sinners, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And now we have been justified by his blood, so much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. All these, ideas, all these truths from, from Romans that we've been studying, that Christ bore our sins and that God condemned him to death, so that as we get to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the more and more we appreciate this Passion Week and the suffering that Jesus endured, the more I believe we can, we can appreciate how Christ has brought our body of sin to nothing so that we no longer should be enslaved to sin. We really ought to let the elements of the Lord's Supper today remind us of that Easter week, the Passion Week, 
and how by the end of that week Christ died and was buried. And we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have also been baptized into his death. And if we have been united with him in a death like his, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, which we will celebrate 14 days from today. And the, je the death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all. And since the life he lives, he lives to God. What does Paul say? We must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So today, the beginning of April, beginning of the time that we celebrate the Easter week, we are remembering the Passion Week and a look at that night that he was betrayed when he sat at supper with his disciples before they went out together to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's what we'll look at today. And we're going to look again at the significant things that happened on that very night. So I want to take you back there in John chapter 13. And as we read it, just have you imagine what it was like that night that Jesus was betrayed, how he showed the full extent of his love and how he symbolized his power to cleanse his disciples of sin and ultimately how he taught his disciples to serve one another. So if you open your Bibles with me to John chapter 13, which is on the night that he was betrayed. And John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, we'll just read the first five verses first. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So Jesus here is with his disciples reclining at the table and eating the Passover meal. It was the last week of his earthly ministry. It was Thursday evening, and it says here that Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. He knew that later that night, he would be in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. They would be falling asleep while Jesus would be praying to the Father. And that same night, he would be betrayed by Judas, one of his own, arrested by the soldiers and officers that were sent by the chief priests, tried before the Sanhedrin, then sent to Pilate, then over to Herod, and then back over to Pilate. And by the early hours of that morning, Pilate would deliver Jesus to be flogged and then bring him before the people and ask, shall I crucify your king? Away with him, away with him, crucify him, they would say. And the chief priests would answer that question with, we have no king but Caesar. On this very night that he was betrayed, the disciples had prepared a Passover meal in an upper room in Jerusalem in accordance with Jesus's instructions. And we're told here as well that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And then Jesus gets up. He takes a towel, he ties that around his waist, he pours some water into a basin, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples using the towel to dry their feet. And if you're not familiar with what foot washing in the first century was all about, you'll glean from some of the commentaries, as I'll quote here, that a host would customarily provide water for his guests upon their arrival so that they might wash their feet. And then it will go on to say that sometimes a servant performed this service for the guests so that they wouldn't wash their own feet. And then this encyclopedia goes on to say that it was considered the most menial task a servant could perform. Now, you have to imagine that the disciples are around a table reclining on their side with their feet extended away from the table and their head towards the table. And then Jesus taking on this towel and this basin of water and beginning to wash each of his disciples' feet as he goes around the table, performing a task normally completed by the host's lowest ranking servant. And what makes Jesus' action so remarkable is he knew he was divine. He knew he had come from God and he was going back to God. He knew he would be receiving all authority and power 
And this must be what Paul had in mind in Philippians 2, 6, when he says that being in very nature God, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he willingly let go of that authority and that divine identity. He didn't cling to it, that authority as King of kings and Lord of lords, and instead made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And John describes Jesus' actions with these very significant words. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It means he showed them the full extent of his love, as it says in the NIV. And to the end can mean absolutely or perfectly, to the utmost. And if you continue reading in this Gospel of John, you'll notice how many times the word love is mentioned. Up until chapter 13, you see a lot of the mentions of light, of life, hardly ever love. But then from 13 and on to chapter 17, 31 times the word love is mentioned. In other words, what Jesus begins to show here is the full extent of his love towards his disciples, how he served them, what he taught them, what, how he prayed for them, and ultimately what he did on the cross for them demonstrating to them how he loved them to the end. And Jesus is showing us what it means to obey his command to love one another. Because when he was finished washing his disciples' feet, he said to them, if then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example, so that you should do as I have done. And by the end of the chapter, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. This love between disciples of Christ is meant to put the love of God on display for all the world to see. Jesus put it on display for his disciples and he said, now you go and love one another. To put on display God's love for human, humankind through us. And God's love is, among others, sacrificial. It is unconditional. And it is certainly a great love. In John 3.16, a very familiar verse to all of us, he says, For God so loved the world, for God in this way loved the world. How did he love the world? That he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That God the Father would give his Son as a sacrifice so that by believing in him, we would not be condemned, but we would have everlasting life in his presence. And yes, it required for God to forsake his own son as he bore the sins of mankind, yours and mine, to the cross. And there he hung by his hands and by his feet with the pain, the shame, and the mocking from the crowd as the sin bearer Christ had to surrender his life and die. God's love is sacrificial. And it is also unconditional. Remember from Romans, while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You and I are so undeserving of his mercy and his forgiveness. We're fully deserving instead of his wrath and his justice. And God's love is so great that even though our sins are many and they are vile, God's love is even greater. Because nothing can separate us from his love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love the words of the, the, the song written by Frederick Martin Lehman. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could, could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And Jesus gave his disciples, you and me, an example. To be willing to make a sacrifice, to be willing to go out of our way, to do it at the expense of ourselves and our own pride, to do it even if we receive nothing in return. Our love can be measured by how much of ourselves we're willing to give of ourselves. Should never make it conditional. Like, oh, I'll love them when they, or I'll love them if. We should love them not as the world loves, but as God does. So on the night that he was betrayed, remember this, that Jesus showed his disciples the full extent of his love by washing their feet. And what else did he show them? What else did he do? Look in verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, 
who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. So Simon Peter, notice how he did not want Jesus to wash his feet. The you and the my here are in emphatic positions. In other words, he could see that this was a role reversal. You shouldn't be washing my feet. You're the master, I'm the servant. You should not wash my feet. How is it that the master would wash the feet of the disciples? But Jesus assured Peter, you will soon understand why he had to wash his feet. Of course, he couldn't understand it at the time. What was Peter expecting? He was expecting a Messiah who would establish a kingdom and that he would suddenly reign in Jerusalem over all the earth. That's who Peter was expecting, not someone to be bending down and washing his feet. In Peter's understanding, Jesus should even not have come to Jerusalem when Jesus told him that he would have to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Do you remember when Peter had acknowledged who Jesus is and said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But then Jesus began to talk about going to Jerusalem and getting killed. And what did Peter then say? He said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And even up to the point when Jesus was arrested, what did Peter do? He cut off the ear of the soldier, thinking that now is the time to take up arms and defend our Messiah. But despite the assurance, Peter continued to insist, you shall never wash my feet. And the phrasing there is, you will not never wash my feet unto the ages. In English, you would say, never in a million years are you going to be washing my feet. But Peter was wrong, and Jesus convinced him it was necessary. If I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. And I love how Peter is here in this moment. You know, if, if it meant having a share in Jesus, then... I want all, he says, wash everything then. He had to learn that it's the master who determines what's necessary. And Jesus explained it's only necessary to wash his feet. And then with this simple analogy of bathing and being clean, Jesus teaches the disciples that the foot washing was in fact symbolic, symbolic of a spiritual cleansing that's only available through Jesus Christ. And Peter would soon understand why Jesus did the washing. And so here's what I also want us to understand, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus was symbolizing what it means for his sacrifice to cleanse us of our sins and to make us righteous. All of those sacrifices of the Old Testament are foreshadowing what Jesus would do as the Lamb of God. If you want to see all of those details, you'll find them in Hebrews chapter 9 about how Jesus would enter into the holy places, not by the blood of bull and bulls and goats like earthly priests would do, but by his own blood he would enter, not just a tent made with hands, but God's sanctuary, so that we might be purified, cleansed without blemish, purified even our consciences. And in chapter 9 of Hebrews, verses 24 through 28, I won't read them all, but you can look at it yourself, how it was meant that Jesus wouldn't have to offer himself repeatedly, but only once, with his own blood, he would sacrifice himself and Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear again, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And so if you and I confess our sinfulness, then God is faithful and just, not only to forgive us of our sins, but also to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, symbolized here in the washing of his disciples' feet. God is the one who determines what's necessary for sins to be forgiven. And the condemnation that you and I deserve for our sins was the death that Jesus took on our behalf. And through his blood, God is able to forgive us our sins and also still remain just because the sentence of death has been passed upon Jesus instead of us.
And this Passover feast that they had gathered to commemorate was really a commemoration of the blood of the lamb that had been put on the doorposts and the lintels during the Passover of Israel. When those families who had the blood of that lamb were passed over so that they, their firstborn didn't die. And Jesus was saying at this feast now that this cup is the new covenant in my blood and do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. That's what the communion wine and the bread is supposed to remind us of, of Jesus on that night that he was betrayed and how he gave himself. There is a fountain filled with blood. There's that other famous hymn drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Isn't it wonderful that God has provided everything necessary for your sins and mine to be forgiven, and he has provided no other means. So remember, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus showed his disciples through the symbolic washing of their feet that his sacrifice would mean the purifying of their souls. And finally, let's read it on in verse 12 of chapter 13. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do it just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so here, Jesus asked his disciples if they understood what he was teaching by his actions. Now, we don't know if any of them answered his question. If they did, it certainly wasn't recorded. But we do have his words to explain this object lesson. He affirmed, first of all, that I am your Lord and your master. Therefore, you are to follow my example of me washing each other's feet. And he affirmed the principle that a servant is never above his own master, nor is a messenger greater than his sender. Therefore, we are to do as he had done. And he affirmed that as we do that, we would be blessed. And what does it require of us? What it require of Jesus? The humility to serve. He calls us to serve one another in humility. And so I ask you today, do you believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation? I hope you say yes. And it implies then, if you say yes, that you believe that he is truly indeed the Son of God. And you have to acknowledge him then as Lord and teacher if he truly is God. Because the only way that Jesus' sacrifice can provide your cleansing and mine is if he is the Son of God. So you cannot just claim him as Savior and not claim him as Lord. He's unable to save the sinner if he isn't also God in the flesh. So you have to believe in his identity as the Son of God if you're going to believe him for your salvation. And that he died on the cross to satisfy the wrath of God and atone for our sins. So if you believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, it implies you agree that he is also your Lord and your teacher. And then I ask you then, do you therefore accept his instructions to you then? Now the thing is you can't refuse his instructions by saying, no, Lord, because those two words can't be used in the same breath. If he is Lord, then it can't be no. If you say no, then you're implying he's not my Lord. The only response a servant can make to his master and Lord is, yes, Lord. And then I ask you, if he is your Savior and he is your Lord, would you be willing to stoop so low as a household servant that's assigned to the washing of dirty, dusty feet? Because serving one another in humility requires, yes, that you're willing to do that. But in today's modern society, we don't need a foot washing, most of us at least. So foot washing is hardly an act, ever an activity for us in the modern world. Sometimes we do it for its symbolic value as well, like, you know, church camps, or sometimes you see it done in a wedding ceremony. But serving one another in humility, you know what it usually looks like in our modern world? It's when a husband and a wife choose that they will serve each other and their, each other's needs before their own and seek to meet their spouse's needs first. Or it's when an owner of a restaurant is willing to work 
in the kitchen doing the dishes so that his dishwasher can make it to their child, their their spouse's, uh, ber uh, their child's birth in uh, at the hospital. Or it's a CEO who's in charge of several companies on the board of many companies, and he's still willing to fold programs for the high school play. Most often, that's when you see a willingness to serve others. And Paul uses the example of Jesus' attitude to instruct the Philippians. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. What is selfish ambition? Selfish ambition is my goals and needs are more important than yours. What is conceit? It's I'm important, or at least I'm more important than you. But in humility, Paul says, count others more significant than yourselves. Have this mind which is in yours in Christ Jesus. And then comes that well-known kenosis passage. What does kenosis mean? It simply means emptying, where Jesus emptied himself. He was indeed God, the highest being of all that exists. He was equal with God, but he didn't cling to that position, his exalted throne. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, Paul says, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So I ask you this, if the Son of God, in all of his glory and majesty, would be willing to take on humanity and wash the dirty feet of fishermen and tax collectors, and then suffer the humiliation of the cross, even though he was innocent, then who are you or me to say, that job is too menial. I'm not going to do that. That's way below me. Who are we to say something like that? So let's remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he showed us how to serve one another. And so in a few moments, we're going to approach this table where we are to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, let's remember what Jesus did for his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. He washed their feet. He did so to show them the full extent of his love. He washed their feet to symbolize the cleansing that his sacrifice on the cross would achieve. And he washed their feet to give them an example of what it means to serve one another in humility. And so when you decide to eat the bread and drink the cup at the Lord's table, the Bible says to do so, to remember him and to proclaim his death until he comes again. And if you understand the cleansing power of the blood that was shed on the cross, then we invite you to eat of this bread and to drink this cup. But then I also advise you to make sure you also demonstrate that you understand his love and his humility by also following his example to love and to serve one another. On the night he was betrayed, he showed the full extent of his love. He symbolized the power to cleanse our sins and he taught his disciples to serve one another. And so as we take the supper today, there are perhaps some of you here today who've been taught that you have to be worthy to eat of the bread and to drink of the wine. You might be, perhaps believe that you have to take careful examination of yourself to find if you are unworthy and then thereby refrain. But I'm going to say quite bluntly that I think such teaching is incorrect. Now, please hear me out. Because Paul says in the passage that we're about to read about the communion, after that passage, he does say, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup in the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then so, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. The first thing to note about that passage is that the word unworthy there is an adverb, not an adjective. Very critical thing for us to understand. If it were an adjective, it would be describing the person is unworthy. But as an adverb, it describes the action of taking the bread and the wine. Hence the English translation, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner, or in some Bibles, who takes it unworthily. Paul was thus describing the manner in which sometimes the Lord's Supper is taken, especially in the day of the, of the Corinthians. He says in verse 20 that when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, one get, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? 
No, I will not, he says. Thus, the Lord's Supper, in that context, sometimes was being eaten and drunk in a manner that made the bread and the wine nothing more than just bread and wine. And one should eat and drink in a way that discerns it as the body and blood of Christ. And so, if you want to discuss who is worthy of the body and blood of Christ in his sacrifice, then we have to approach the Lord's table recognizing that none of us are worthy. Christ gave his life for us while we were weak, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, and yet enemies of God. By all means, yes, examine yourself that you're not eating and drinking without discerning the body of Christ. Yes, do that. And yes, confess any sins you may have and receive the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus. And yes, work towards reconciliation with anyone whom you have wronged and experience and express God's forgiveness. And yes, by all means, admit that you are unworthy to receive the gracious gift of, un of eternal life. But I say also, take and eat of this bread and drink of this wine in remembrance of him, in remembrance of his body and his blood that was shed for unworthy people like me and you. And then you will not be taking and eating and drinking it in an unworthy manner. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much that you loved us and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for us. And that by believing in him, we might have eternal life. Lord, I, I, I believe that most of us here today are here because we have received this, eternal, this gift of eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ, your son. And so I also know, Lord, that many of us will today take the bread and the wine to remember his death, his body and given for us and his blood shed for us. And I just praise you, Lord, that you gather us here each week. May we always remember that it is only because of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that we can come into your presence. But Lord, if there's anyone here who's still in doubt or still wondering what it means to follow Christ, to believe in him for their salvation, to understand him as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that you open up their heart to, first of all, see their own sinfulness and their need for a Savior. And Lord, that you would reveal yourself in all of your glory, even if it means the glory of your Son hanging on the cross, so that they too might understand that you have already paid the price for their sins. I pray, Lord God, that they will not leave this place without first understanding what it means to have received eternal life by grace through faith. And Lord, now as we approach this table, thank you that you made us who were unworthy, worthy of being in your holy, majestic presence. And as we remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we proclaim his death until he comes. In his name we pray. Amen.